Uh, first of all, I feel extremely flattered that I can talk here. It's uh, the most, one of the most awesome Bitcoin conferences in the world, and I think it's a huge honor to be able to talk here. And today, I'm going to talk about introducing stack groups to Bitcoin. First of all, we have a growing problem. Um, currently, we have millions of Bitcoin users, but maybe only 50,000 full nodes. And um, the chain is already about 500 gigabytes, and uh, it's growing by up to 200 gigabytes per year. So it keeps getting harder and harder to, grow, uh, to, to run a full node. And um, since that problem is growing, somehow the, the question arises, can we compress the chain? And unfortunately, we can't really compress the chain because it consists mostly of hash, so hashes and stuff like that, which is mostly random data, and then the data you cannot really compress. It. But magic internet money needs magic Mumma, which is zero knowledge proofs. And zero knowledge proofs have um, very magical properties. Um, here is like a scheme how they work. You have some kind of program. And you have some inputs to that program, and both of that are fed into a prover. And the prover then generates a proof that this program with this inputs ends in a particular state. And the verifier verifies that proof. And the cool thing here is that there is a huge asymmetry. Um, that we can see here, like if we apply to, to, to Bitcoin, like the program is our consensus rules, and uh, the input is the blockchain. We put it into a prover, and we derive a state proof from that that tells us what is the current state, like who owns what, what is the current uh, state of the UTXO set. It allows us to compress the blockchain by a factor uh, of like about 500,000 or so. Like we take the 500 megabytes of data and compress it into a proof that is less than a megabyte, which is like a 500,000 x improvement. And actually, it's even more than that because if the blockchain would grow to a terabyte, it would still be a megabyte to with. And that is quite impressive, and I think um, this form, this extreme form of compression is quite game-changing for Bitcoin. Um, we are building such a trade state proof at ZeroSync, and uh, we are building it in three phases. The first is a header chain proof, which is very similar to an SPD client. It basically uh, proves the hash chain that all the headers stay linked together. It proves the proof of work and the control of work in the chain. It proves difficulty adjustments and uh, basically everything that an SVD client does. On top of that, it also computes a Merkle tree over um, the headers, such that such that you can um, uh, easily improve uh, proof inclusion of any block or also every transaction in the chain. And um, the second proof that we're going to build is the so-called we call it assumed valid proof. Um, it is similar to Bitcoin, the, the mode in Bitcoin Core, which is called the assume method. It uh, verifies all consensus rules except for the scripts, or in particular, in, except for the, uh, the signatures. It assumes the signatures to be valid, but it does verify all other um, consensus rules. In particular, it verifies like the coin emission schedule, it verifies that nobody creates money out of thin air, and it uh, creates the correct UTXO set, assuming that the signatures are valid. And the third proof that we're going to build is a full chain set proof that actually verifies all consensus rules. Like small asterisk here, I'll explain later that it's not quite all, but almost all consensus rules can be verified in uh, the full chain set proof, including the signatures. And uh, basically, all of the data in the blockchain can be verified in the full chain set proof very quickly. Um, we will take some time until we will be at the full chain set proof, but um, we haven't made significant progress on the other ones yet. I'll come to that later. In general, Bitcoin and ZKPs can be a great lot because um, they fit very well together. Bitcoin is very hard to change, as we know. Some people want to activate some things, and it's usually quite hard. Some people burn out by trying to activate things. <laughs> The cool thing with CKPs is no forks are required. Like I don't need to ask anyone for permission to build a chain set proof because I'm just taking the, the existing data and putting it into my compression function. So no activation bar is required. It's also very cool. You will have to prove it only once, and then you have a proof, and then you can share it with millions of people, and everybody can verify that the state is correct. 
very uh, quickly and very easily. Also, nodes can reshare that proof easily, so you don't have to have any connection with that prover. Um, like, I, I just give you a proof, and it doesn't matter if I proved it myself. You can just verify that it's correct, and if it's correct, it's correct, and it doesn't matter who proved it. And uh, also, anyone can become a prover. Like, I could prove the chain up until now, and then you can extend that proof with the next block if you want. And uh, you don't have to ask anyone for permission, you don't have to interact with a former prover or so, uh, with, uh, with, with a guy who, who created a proof. You can just um, do it permissionlessly um, as you wish. We focus for, for now, like for the last half year, we focused on building an header chain proof. That was our first milestone. And um, the proof architecture looks like this um, on the bottom here. This, uh, those are the headers, and we batch them into batches of I think about uh, 1,600 headers. And um, then these batches they are getting aggregated, and then the aggregated proofs are getting aggregated, aggregated, aggregated until we end up in a single proof. Um, we do that with so-called proof recursion. So we verify a proof in a proof. Actually, we verify two proofs in a proof to create the single proof, and this is where we get this Merkle-like tree structure. And um, this also gives us this uh, this awesome compression because um, yeah, whenever we have two proofs, we just turn it into one proof, and then it's constant size again. And you guys are lucky because you can scan this now and be like one of the first people in the universe to sync the Bitcoin blockchain on your phone with a CKP. And this is like as fresh as it gets, it's like right out of the oven. Like, I was, um, thanks to the guy who spoke before me, like, he was way too late. <laughs> that was super awesome for us because it took like 30 seconds before, before I went here on stage. The last. <laughs> oh, that's it? What's wrong? Yeah? Ah, okay. Yeah, 30 seconds before I went here on stage. Um, the proof became ready. <laughs> to see this here, like, I had all day like this half, and I had this half, but uh, it wasn't fully aggregated yet. But now, it is actually fully aggregated, and um, I'll show you a little demo. I'm synced. You're synced? Yeah, congratulations, man. I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> so I click here and it takes a couple of seconds to download it and like I'm not really sure it. And then we are synced. So now you can clap. <laughs> <laughs> and um, here we, we see what that state actually looks like. I already talked about the chain state and um, how, how does that chain state look like? Well, uh, we have like everything you would expect there, the block height. Um, the latest timestamp, this is the latest medium timestamp. Um, yeah, very important, of course, the best block hash. This is like the latest hash in the chain. Then this one is very important as well, um, the total chain, uh, the, the total work in the chain. Because one thing, um, yeah, because if you have two proofs, you want to know which one is the longer chain, and you just do it by comparing this single number. And um, yeah, you have some other things here that are not that important. Uh, the other thing that is important is here those um, trees. There in the background, there's uh, Peter Todd. Hey, Peter Todd. We have a Merkle Mountain range here. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you're happy about that. Um, yeah, those are the roots of the Merkle Mountain range that allow you to um, uh, basically have logarithmic size inclusion proof for any block in the chain. And that is already really cool because people have been thinking about adding such data structures to the blockchain for quite a while. But as you know, like it always ends up in white shedding and nothing gets activated. And um, for this probably also a good thing. But uh, that's just how Bitcoin development goes. But here, we don't have to ask anyone. We just did that. We just proved that. And if our proof is correct, I'm not quite sure if it is correct. I mean, like we did our best and like we tried to fix all the bugs, but there will be bugs, and I'm not 100 percent certain about it. It will take a couple of years until we can really trust that thing. But the cool thing is really. We can augment the chain with new data structures and prove these data structures. This is way better than like usual commitments because usually, like for example, in Ethereum, you have this 
Um, you know, there's no Patricia tree root in your box, but it doesn't really tell you anything. Like, miners can just mine invalid blocks and put any root in there, and it doesn't really mean anything. But these roots, they are proven. Like, you have a proof that this is actually the result of verifying 800,000 headers, and um, there is no way to forge that, as assuming that we didn't do too many stupid things. Okay, so this is the demo of our chain, uh, our chain set proof. And let's go back here. Now we'll talk a bit about our setup, how, how we facilitate all that. Um, first of all, we're using Stark proofs. Um, Starks are nice, they are transparent. Maybe you've heard of Snarks, and uh, Snarks are a bit cumbersome because they require a trusted setup, and then everybody who's using it relies on these people who made that trusted setup that they actually deleted the toxic waste. And if they didn't delete the toxic waste, then the proof is basically worthless. And Starks don't require any trusted setup, so they're completely transparent and there is no way um, to forge it. Also, they rely on relatively conservative cryptographic assumptions. Um, other proof systems, in particular SNARKs, they rely on uh, pairings and, and, and funny stuff like that. And um, SNARKs don't need that. They rely mostly on uh, the assumption that there's um, collision-resistant hash functions, which is a super conservative assumption, even less, con even more conservative than believing that the discrete algorithm is hard. Um, here, another asterisk, like, it's not quite true what I just said, because for this recursion, we usually use not just collision-resistant hash functions, we also use algebraic hash functions, which are a bit more novel, or like significantly more novel than stuff like Sharp. So, we do rely on the hardness of the discrete logarithm at the end, but it's still not too fancy, like it's not too much new enough. And uh, yeah, another good reason for them, uh, for us to use them is that they are among the fastest proof systems available these days. Starkware, the company who built Starks, um, they developed the Cairo language. And um, they did that because usually you have to implement proof, proofs uh, in arithmetic circuits. And uh, it's basically you, you have to express everything you do in math. And uh, that is like way more complicated than usual programming. And that's why they invented this high level programming language that allows you to, com uh, to express complex programs. Um, more or less as you're used to from other programming languages. And also they support analog computation, which is very important when you want to prove Bitcoin. Because, for example, the Bitcoin transaction um, is very unbounded in the sense that you don't know in upfront how many inputs it will have, you don't know how many outputs it will have. So to prove the transaction, you uh, need to yeah, be able to, to, to prove unbounded computation, which is possible in Cairo because they are using this virtual machine. The, huh? Is missing the slide? Oops. Okay. This is not good. Yeah, somehow I messed it up. It's missing the slide about the proving time. The proving time, uh, we used 14 servers. The servers, um, they all had about 500 gigabytes of, um, of RAM and a swap file of uh, terabyte. And <laughs> we ran them for about 8 to 10 days. And, um, yeah, it cost us about $4,000 to prove the header chain. Um, but the great thing about these proof systems is this huge asymmetry. Like, we invested significant computational power to prove this thing once, but to verify it, it's super easy. Like, you already did it on your phones, basically instantly. This is like a huge asymmetry, and uh, it's worth investing once in that uh, computation. And also, um, we don't have to do it all the time. Like now that we have proven it once, we can just extend it with new blocks, and extending it with new blocks is, is much cheaper. I, I think it would be possible to do it over on my laptop. So far, so good. Everything is great, but <laughs> as always in life, there are limitations and trade-offs. And uh, yeah, first of all, we cannot prove the longest chain rule. Um, it's hard to prove that something does not exist, so uh, I cannot give you proof that there is no longer chain. Uh, that's quite impossible. I cannot prove that there is no way in the universe a chain that is longer. So, um, as Bitcoin itself, you still require the honest peer assumption. So you have to be connected to some peer to peer network, and if there is at least one honest peer, then you can easily resolve um, conflicts and you can instantly basically say what the longest chain is. 
And that's quite cool because uh, in Bitcoin itself you cannot do that. In Bitcoin you, you have to download every claimed chain. Like if somebody tells you, hey, I have a chain that is like a billion blocks long, then you have to download and check if it's true or not. You, you don't have to download. You, you have to download only that one, one megabyte of proof. And um, if it's true, then it's true. And if it's not true, then you know it immediately. Um, this is way more concerning. And, uh, I've talked about this with a couple of people. This is what, what, what people mostly say about like, um, when they critique it. This is the main thing. Is it a proof if I cannot understand it? There are just like, how many people here would say they have a decent understanding of stocks? Yeah? See? Okay, so we trust here like that we three people don't <laughs> see <them> up. <laughs> so there is some truth to it. There is, we, we introduce more complexity. That is absolutely true. And I don't want to uh, sugarcoat that. We do introduce more complexity. However, um, I can also do like. I can do like <laughs> <laughs> Joe. <laughs> that was like two years ago. People already shit it here. <laughs> and um, that was actually that, that picture motivated me a lot to uh, dig deeper into stocks. And, um, so yeah, some, some Bitcoin wizards already like it, which should increase the trust. Um, but the argument by authority is probably not what convinces you guys. This is maybe even more convincing. This is uh, the start StarkNet, like StarkRail is running StarkNet. And uh, if you think stocks are nonsense, then you should break StarkNet and like get the $34 million that they have locked in there. And uh, the longer StarkNet runs without getting hacked, the more Confident we can be that there might be something to stocks. Um, if we can hack it, I will be impressed. The next uh, critique that I got from Luke Dasher, he said it's a hard fork. And um, I get that Puritan view of Bitcoin because it's true to some, to, to, to some degree, because um, there is a data validity problem. Yeah. Uh, I can prove to you that I have a chain, like I know a chain that results in a particular state. But this doesn't prove to you that you could download it if you wanted to. Uh, so there will always be the data availability problem. The, the proof by, by definition cannot prove to you that the data is actually available if you wanted to download it. So um, that is a fundamental issue of fossil knowledge books in general. And that can become problematic in the um, For example, there could be that scenario that we have like millions of CK nodes, everybody, everybody runs uh, a full node on their phone. And the man does it, like everyone does it, and we have like millions of people who are running uh, ZK nodes on, on their phones, and still you have like 50,000 conventional nodes as you have today. Now people could create a network split. Uh, so some evil miner could like, create a block that they prove, and then they tell they, 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 they tell the ZK nodes about this chain, and they prove to the ZK nodes that it's actually a valid chain, but they don't tell the other, they don't tell the conventional nodes about this chain. And this way you could introduce a chain split. Because half or like this the, the, the ZK nodes would believe in one state and the conventional nodes would believe in the other state, and that would be horrible for Bitcoin because yeah, all we want is like converging against one single state, and you could break it here. However, this is not really different than the 51% assumption because to pull off this attack that I just described, you need to have um, 51% of the hash power. Otherwise, it's, it's just impossible to, because you have to produce a valid chain to convince the ZK not to believe in it. But, and um, that's why I would say it's not that easy to really exploit it. I mean, you can look all kinds of things like with all the lightning justice transactions and all that stuff. Um, I'm not sure how practical it is. Also, in particular, I think the problem can become only significant if we, most people, only use proofs and the other nodes are all malicious and don't share the block data anymore, which is pretty unrealistic, I would say, because if only one person shares the, 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 true, uh, the true chain, then all these attacks don't work anymore. However, there is the data availability problem, and it does exist. The best, or like the most conservative um, mitigation is probably to just um, never sync to the latest state, or like to the, to the end of the chain, but like to sync only to uh, almost the end of the chain and download the last thousand blocks or so. 
we always download the latest thousand bucks and it's really, really, really hard to pull over any kind of effect. Okay, about the ZeroSync project. ZeroSync uh, was founded last year, summer last year, and we are a Swiss nonprofit organization. We are building free and open source Bitcoin software. Um, in general, we are focused on applying cutting edge cryptography to Bitcoin to advance Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, we were funded by grants from Geometry Research, Sakra gave us a grant, also OpenSense gave, gave us a grant. Thanks a lot at this point, I hope uh, I make you guys happy. Um, we are a team of four developers and uh, yeah, we're trying to go. Our roadmap. Yeah, first of all, a couple of minutes ago we completed the header chain proof, so uh, now it's time to integrate it into wallet apps. We have already talked uh, to Laolo from from Lightning Labs, who's excited to build an experimental version of Bitcoin Neutrino and uh, yeah, integrate it into Neutrino. Also, um, we were already in contact with some people from Electrum who might be eventually uh, interested in, in uh, building an experimental client. And uh, even more important, it's like we want to get to a complete full, full chain proof. And currently, we are not quite there yet, mostly because the proving is so expensive. Like, the current setup would not scale to prove the entire chain. That would be the value of half a million dollar computational power. So, um, I don't have that. Maybe it's some of you were around like when Bitcoin was like four dollars or so. You have some spare money. <laughs> um, if not, we will just try to improve the proof of performance by under 2000 x. Um, that is definitely possible. It's it's not like a pipe dream. There is already a project called Risk Zero. Um, they have already done all. All kinds of very interesting stuff. They uh, used to work on Intel and they know chips very well and mobile programming very well. And they did all kinds of very interesting stuff to, in particular, make SHA-256 very, uh, very fast. Uh, I have to say, proving the Bitcoin chain is mostly proving SHA-256. Um, and also, proving SHA-256 is very expensive in proof systems, much more expensive than on a computer. It is actually, SHA is designed such that it's easy to um, Compute SHA on, on, on a regular CPU. However, in these proof systems, you have to do everything in field elements, and uh, there is no XOR, there is no bitwise operations, and that makes all kinds of regular hash functions or conventional hash functions very, very expensive. And uh, in general, the, the Bitcoin chain is very proof unfriendly, and so we have to do all kinds of sophisticated hacks to uh, uh, proof SHA in particular very quickly. And there are lots of things that we can do. First of all, we can use a smaller field. Currently, we are using a 256 bit field because we are using um, the verifier of Starcraft. Like, they have already a verifier that is in production and they have settled, I think, a billion dollar in like, um, gambling stuff and so what they do and they do. And um, we, uh, we are using that verifier because the verifier is a crucial part. The prover could be completely broken. If the verifier is correct, then you can't afford it. Um, you can't create any broken proof or so that the verifier would accept as long as the verifier is correct. And um, that's why we are using the, the, the verifier Starker, and the Starker verifier was built to be efficient on the EVM, and the EVM register size is 256 bits, and then they said, yeah, no, no, just let's take a 256 bit field. In the end, they regretted it and uh, thought, ah, it's made way better to do it like the other people, like with zero and, and so on and use smaller fields, like 64-bit fields, or like 32-bit fields. And uh, yeah, we are going to switch to that too. Also, we can use more efficient um, hash functions in our proofs. Like, uh, the proofs, they mostly consist of Merkle trees. And uh, Merkle trees are like full of hashes, and um, we don't use conventional hash functions, we use so-called algebraic hash functions. And currently, we are using Peterson hashes because they are uh, like the most conservative algebraic hash function, but the industry is kind of shifting in the direction of Poseidon because it's about 20x faster. Yeah, that makes everything faster, it makes it uh, in particular faster to do proof recursion, and currently that is mostly the bottleneck. When you can do very fast recursion, you can also parallelize as much as you, put, as you want, and uh, yeah, that gives you a huge speed up. Then there's also that thing, um, you can have like a grinding, uh, there is a grinding factor, like it works such that you build such a Merkle tree, and then at the end, from the root, you derive readiness where you should query that Merkle tree. I shouldn't go too much into detail because it would take too much time. But long story short, um, what stacks already do is like they do a little bit of proof of work to make it harder to cheat this random sampling. 
And um, when you make a different work even harder, when you write like, I don't know, 48 bits instead of 32 bits, then uh, you can do less queries. And less queries means yeah, the proofs become easier to verify, they become more compact, and in particular, proof recursion becomes cheaper again. And proof recursion means yeah, we can do more parallelization and everything becomes much faster. You got yeah. five. Five minutes left. Yeah, I think we could be good. Um, yeah, the two main things that we have to prove is SHA 256. I already talked about that. We could have like um, specially crafted built ins to make this very efficient. Also, the other thing is like SECB. Um, Signature verification is the other pain point. Um, the, when the underlying field that we work on is different than the field of SECB, then it becomes very hard to emulate that SECB field in our field. And um, that makes signature verification very expensive. But there are ways to like hack things that you can have in the base field. Um, basically, an emulation of the base field of SECB, and then the signature verification becomes much faster. Another thing is that we can just throw hardware at it, we can throw GPUs at it, and in particular for the catch up of the full chain set proof, like proving the existing 800,000 blocks, we will definitely use some FPGAs or ASICs or so to uh, yeah, make it more cheap. And yeah, once we have done all these proven performance, then we can start completing the full chain proof. Further applications, first of all, we are working uh, together with uh, the awesome Andrew Nielsen, who built the mini stack open source prover that is like the first fully open source prover that. Uh, yeah, it's publicly available. It's a general purpose prover. You can use it for any kinds of statements. And he's part of our team now. And um, yeah, we want to push that prover and we want it to become like an industry standard, ideally. Um, also, we are building the ZDK, a toolkit to generate custom Bitcoin proofs or any kinds of statements. For example, if you want to do like um, a solvency proof as an exchange or like um, another interesting thing is like partially uh, blind signatures, so I, I signed blindly some transaction, but uh, I know some things about it. Like I don't know everything about the transaction, but I know, for example, one output will go to this person and they will get that. And um, that is a cool thing that you can do with uh, zero knowledge rules as well. Another thing that we have been working on is uh, ZK coins. Again, the awesome Peter Todd, he invented time side validation, and uh, we basically built time side validation on steroids, which is more or less uh, adding zero knowledge groups to, to, to time side validation to make it even yeah, way more scalable and uh, also to add really great privacy because you can obfuscate both the transaction amounts and the transaction graphs, and then you get like Zcash like privacy or even better. <coughs> Another thing that we have been working on is uh, sets for files, which is decentralized file hosting by Lightning. It basically allows you to uh, trustlessly uh, buy or purchase files by Lightning. Like the server gives you like an encrypted version of the file, and then you buy a pre-image of a Lightning to decrypt it, and then you can be certain that the server didn't cheat. Also, a great application of um, ZKDs. Last cool thing is that we also partner with Blockstream. They are running this cool Blockstream satellite thing where you can sync the chain from uh, outer space. All you need is a satellite dish on the internet. And um, yeah, this is like, of course, a very bandwidth constraint. And um, that's why it's a great match for, for chain set proof. For them, it's way more awesome to just broadcast chain set proof instead of 500 gigahertz of blockchain. Takeaways. So CKP is enabled groundbreaking compression. I think that's that's just a fact. Um, it's really groundbreaking cryptography, and um, because they, are, they have such groundbreaking um, purpose, uh, <coughs> because they have such groundbreaking properties, they will likely be the future of Bitcoin or in general cryptocurrency. Um, the main limitation currently is that the proof of performance is not quite yet there. However, uh, we'll probably solve that soon, and there is like lots of evidence that it is absolutely solvable. And yeah, CK SPD times are ready now. Like you guys just witnessed that these things are actually there, and uh, now you can try to pick it apart and you find bugs, and uh, I'd be happy if you try to help us improve it. Do you have any questions? Yes, please. How often do you envision running the prover? Oh, I have a question. How often do we envision running the prover? Um, yeah, currently the batch size was like 1,600 headers, so we would run it every 1,600 headers. It's like every 10 days or so. Can you come up here and ask for the mic? 
But yeah, you can sync the rest of the chain very easily, right? It's uh, just, in particular, it's just the headers, it's uh, just a megabyte or so more. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk about the problem. When you're seeing. Which one? Uh, the datability problem. When you're seeing uh, 51% is necessary to commit the attack, I think I disagree because you just need to have enough power, dropping to fulfill the duty creators, and send the proof, or like send the proof of the other chain. So, from an adversary point, you we need to have like actually enough to generate the kind of the kind and that they have enough C nodes to like eclipse uh, the, the failure side, the failure nodes. And as soon as you can do this, uh, you can resolve the or you can slow down the rate of blocks until uh, lightning justice transaction or lightning CCD expires and like zero performance. Yeah. I think it's not that easy, but Particularly because when we when we get to that point where really like lots of people are using these tools, then you will also have like lots of groupers, like people who will accept the chain. That means like you will probably always there will always be somebody who proves the, the, the correct chain. Sure, but if you have like uh, some parity issue or like some kind of until you have like 50k nodes which are like meeting the proof, mm -hmm. you do have like an interest of using the whole network. As a lightning, like as a big lightning nodes are the new things people use. And I think when we're talking about lightning, um, um, this idea of like withholding a transaction that only works when the proof is not very well suited for lightning nodes. And I guess people will not use it if it's not very well suited for lightning nodes. So the proof will probably be such that it will be very well suited for lightning nodes, which means it proves to uh, lightning <coughs> nodes all uh, in the general channel closes, which is what they are interested in. Um, once um, a node never accepts anything but like these kind of proofs, then they will always get all the unit level turning clauses as well, and you cannot really withhold anything from them. I mean, assuming they don't know what current chain chains are. Sorry? Assuming they are doing current chain chip or like current, uh, all the blocks of the current chain chip for their, uh, all their chains of interest. So I didn't get it. No, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, do you assume that you do have to keep doing the blocks without relying on the proof? Or? Keep the blocks? Yeah, keep, keep doing the blocks without uh, relying on the proof? Or what is the activity of that here? Um, okay. Somebody get it? Uh, uh. Uh, you, uh, you guys should probably yeah. finish this face to face. Yeah. We're, we're out of time anyway. We're out of time, man. So we'll, we'll talk about it. Thank you.